behind on that. Let's, let's begin. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Father, we thank you for that narrow road that you have put us upon. And Lord, sometimes that narrow road can get really, really rocky. But Father, you are there with us. And Father, as we are remembering that we are totally dependent upon you. Father, as we are remembering that better is one day in your house with you than going on that broad road. Father, as we remember these things and as we put them into practice in our lives, Father, we get to the end of each day with a hand raised high in victory because we recognize that you have gone with us through that day. You have taken us over those rocky places. And Father, you have brought us to where you want us. And we praise you for that. Lord, as we continue in the service today, we pray that we would continue to be reflecting upon you, thinking on you. And Father, as Pastor comes in a few minutes with the message, we pray, the Lord, that you would open our hearts to what he has for us, to what you have for us through Pastor's message. And Lord, we'll praise you for that. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat if you would. <clears throat> I'd like to teach you a new song today. How many of you have ever listened to the Messiah by Handel? Yes. That's not what we're learning. Okay. Just wanted to put your minds at ease on that. Uh, this song is called You Are My All in All. I'm going to go ahead and sing through the first verse and the chorus. If you know it, jump right in on that. After we do that first verse, then we'll come back and have everybody join us. Really easy melody. The words are really easy. It's designed to be sung as a round. We're going to wait on that for a little while until we get the thing down really good after a few times. Then we'll come back and try it as a round. So this is how it goes. <clears throat> Let's go ahead. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb.
around the round for the next time. Pastor, would you come up, please? It's interesting how our point of view of life and people changes as we, we age. When I was younger, I thought that people that were my age right now were really old. <laughs> I keep fighting that notion. And when I was younger and I was looking at people that had gray hair, according to what Scripture says, that people with gray hair are very wise. And I couldn't wait to grow up. And I, I, I began to draw my first gray hairs at a younger age. I'm thinking, am I really wise? I don't know. Or you expect older people, whatever that means, to be more patient. Right? At a young age, oh, on the tip of our tongue, it's always, I can't wait. And, and you expect that as you grow older and wiser... You become more patient. If you were to answer your que- yourself the question, how patient are you? It'd be a tough, tough answer. So I picked up my brother Caleb this morning as we were coming to church, and we were on a coal right at Northview. And for whatever reason, everybody had green except my left turn lane. And there was nothing coming from the opposing side, but I had a red light. It wasn't flashing. And I thought back at the days where back in the day was a law for motorcycles. You're not heavy enough. You wait a couple of cycles, you make a left hand turn and go. And I'm thinking, I can't make a left. I got this guy here with me. Kind of not good for the pastor to run the red light. I'm looking, no cop, no stop. There's no cops. I didn't make a left turn on red. But I'm thinking, where's my patience? How patient are you? And taking that idea of being patient with the idea of remaining faithful in perseverance, not giving up. We've come in situations where giving up may be an easier solution to all our problems. Giving up on a job. I've had enough. How many years I've been working like this and I never get any respect. I'm done. I quit. You come to relationships and or marriages where they're broken up at the drop of a hat. I've had enough. It's hard to be patient with people. It's hard to forgive 70 times 7 and persevere. We've had a tough year, and I've got bad news for you. It's not going to get any easier. 2022 will not make it any easier. 23 will be tougher. Because the Lord is coming back. And in that day, there will be an increased frequency in all of these calamities, from earthquakes to pandemics to evil. For there's a struggle and there's a battle and there's a warfare. We cannot give up. Easy to throw your hat in and want to start over, but you never start over because the wounds that were left on your heart as you walked away will not heal. Yes, we give up on each other in situations or corporations. But what do you do when you're tempted to give up on God? So we're coming to the end of this year. I guarantee you that any farmer, talk to Jerry. Any farmer can tell you and talk to you about not giving up. You got to plant. You got to water. You got to feed. As you wait for the harvest. So this morning we'll start, for I know that I'm in competition with some ribs. We'll start in talking about not giving up. As we come to the end of this year, turning the page, strapping our belts, getting ready for what's coming. For we are the church, and Jesus promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We are not victims. We're not passive. We are not an audience. We are active. 
A church in prayer is a church that overwhelms the power of darkness and is able to win the hearts of people. Do not give up. Most of you have heard this story, but I want to bring it back to you. And it's, it's easy to listen and admire the lives of others, be inspired and say, oh, I wish. That's easy. But to live that way, that is a God thing. You've heard about this young man that at the age of 22, he already failed in business. He figured maybe business is not for me. So at the age of 23, he ran for state assembly and he lost the race. Then he figured, okay, maybe politics is not for me. I'll go back to business. And at the age of 24, he failed again at the business venture he started. So you'd figure that at the age of 27, he had a nervous breakdown. Don't say the name, but how many of you know who I'm talking about? At the age of 27, he almost lost his mind. So then he said, okay, he pulled himself by the bootstraps, and, and he tried again at the age of 29 to run for the speaker of the state assembly, and he failed. He was defeated. So he figured, okay, state assembly won't do, speaker of the assembly won't do, let me try for president. So at the age of, well, actually no, presidential elector at the age of 31, he was denied even that opportunity. He figured, okay, let me try for Congress. Maybe those that know me don't like me, I'll try for the nation. So he ran for Congress at 34, he was defeated. Tried again at 39, defeated. Tried again at the Senate at 46, defeated. But we think that we want to place and leave an impact of a legacy of a lifetime of success. But if you look at Scripture, God uses one person for one time, specifically for a number of short years or events to impact the world around them. Jesus was raised for 30 years, and we read nothing except that incident at the temple at 12. Humble and meek, obedient and patient. So he would change the world and eternity for three years. So here's this guy again. At the age of 47, he ran to be the vice president of the new Republican Party. He failed, defeated. At age of 49, he ran for the U.S. Senate again, again against Stephen Douglas, and he was defeated. What else is there? Oh, he ran for president, elected as president at age 51, President Lincoln, best president this country has ever seen, loving God, country, and freedom. He was willing to risk failure and defeat time after time until God opened the door of success. He was not an overnight success. How many of you here this morning may be in a situation or remember times where you're just about to give up? And are you ready when the enemy begins to turn up the heat and test the church nationwide and locally to get us to give up as they tried from one side to another to shut the doors of the church, to shut our mouths, to give up, give in? You know, we are the sheep of the Lord. But we're not called to be sheep in the world. We are more than conquerors. We're called to persevere and overcome. So I pray this morning the Lord will reach deep down in our own hearts and stir up that spirit of battle on our knees and prayer and vision and decisions that we would lead, live to make an impact, not just passing by, don't give up. We look at some people and say, wow, what a great prayer warrior. So we go to them and say, could you pray for me? We go to others and say, wow, look at the blessings God's pouring on them. Oh, they must be lucky. What a bad term to use there. And we say, well, why doesn't God love me? Why do some people reach more souls for Jesus than others. What's different? 
Well, Calvin Coolidge gives us an answer. Not the answer. Our answer is in the Scriptures. But Calvin Coolidge says, press on. Nothing in the world can take the place of perseverance. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Not talent, not genius, not education, not even birthright. Don't give up. Jesus, in this sermon, on the mount, surrounded by hungry people, he feeds their souls, and he gives them commands, and he gives them promises. The reason why many times we fail, the reason many times we come up empty, it's because we don't want to bother the man upstairs, or, or we don't want to bother God too much, or, or we're afraid to ask, and we don't understand what Jesus himself commanded, how we should live our lives as believers, as overcomers. Where events don't come to us, we take life by the color, and we stand not as victims. Jesus says, and he presents it over and over throughout the gospel, that God does not delight in those that give up. He loves those that hold on. Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 62, Luke 9, 62, Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand on the plow and looks back. That's the idea of Lot's wife. They started running away. They listened to the call, and they're running away from God's judgment. They're obedient, but as she's running away, in her mind, she's leaving things behind, and she's being tugged on by the things she left behind of the what if. How about the other? And as she looks back, her life is terminated. Don't look back. No one who puts his hand on a plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean that perseverance will get you saved. It means that once you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's the one thing the Holy Spirit places in your heart. The strength to persevere and move on because you trust and you have faith in Him. We want to unpack this box called faith and what it means to trust the Lord. The fact that both trust and faith, they're rooted in love and knowing Him. Because the more I know Him, the more I will trust Him in situations I don't understand. And I'll have faith to move on. Trust is upwards, faith is forwards. I trust who He is, therefore I got faith to move forward. So, the one principle and the one life-changing lesson that we want to tap into this morning is that persevering faith in God is the heartbeat of a victorious life. Persevering faith. And we put those together because the world says, talking about a higher power, or anything they could imagine. They say, just have faith. That's empty wish. It's a persevering faith in God. That becomes my heartbeat. Everything I think of, every way I live, comes right back to understanding His heart, which begins to be synchronized with my own heartbeat. Let's look at verse 7 and 8. Verse 7 and 8. Ask. Jesus says, go ahead and ask. And if you do ask, it will be given to you. It doesn't say it may be given to you. Oh, but that cannot be. That, that, that cannot be so. I, I know people prayed for things. God didn't give it to them. So something is wrong. Either God is lying to us or we misunderstand what Jesus is saying. 
And therefore, we have this alternating weave and bob of the church's maturity life in weakness and strength. When do you get it? Jesus says, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek. And you'll find. Now you may find, or some will find. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be open to you. What a promise. Who's going to open it? God. If you knock, Jesus promises the door will open. Now, sometimes we may be knocking on the wrong doors. That's the, one of the points we want to clarify as we look at Scripture. Knock, and God will open it. For everyone who asks, here's the promise. We got the command in verse 7, and the grammar terminology used here is very important, which actually affirms and strengthens the command. Listen, you got to ask, you got to seek, you got to knock, because everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. If Jesus were standing here, you could look into his eyes, and you heard these things, wouldn't you walk out of here with a whole brand new life? Because he tells you, if you ask, you're going to get it. If you look for it, you're going to find it. If you knock, you won't be standing up outside just waiting. How should we live our lives with these promises? So, if we believe and dive deep in understanding this value and strength of persevering faith in God that must become my heartbeat. How do I do that? And what does Jesus show us in this message about that? First of all, first principle in this persevering faith in God is perseverance implies a trusting relationship. Perseverance implies a trusting relationship. The problem is that, truth be told, a lot of us trust God this much. We preach it, we sing it, we want it, but we trust God this much. The way this verse is written out in the grammatic Greek tense that is written... All of these commands are in the present tense, not future, not past, present tense. That means continuous action. And as we look at this here, ask, seek, and knock. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. The beauty is what the Lord is doing here. He's showing us a, an inviting relationship. You ask, come to me. Now, we, 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 we hear this a lot, saying, listen, if you need anything, just let me know. That's such an American thing to say. Because we know that that has limits. I told that to someone this morning. I said, listen, if there's anything you need, but you got to be specific because you want to go from the generic invitation that makes you look good. I say, if there's any money that you need, let us know. If there's any food or transportation or repairs in the house, you let us know. We will do it. It's a blank check. It's a very nice thing to say at weddings and funerals. If you need anything, please let me know. Yes, I need $1,500 to pay for this. Well, let's pray about it, brother. The Lord will provide. <laughs> That's not what God is doing here. He's not making a, a statement that makes religion look good. He's saying, you got to ask. I'm inviting you to a relationship with me. Don't ask the priest. Don't ask the church. Come straight to me. It's much more than this inviting relationship. It's an abiding relationship. In other words, if you keep on asking, that means you can hang around. You don't get three wishes and we're done. You keep on asking. That's why Jesus says in John 15, abide in me. In other words, remain with me or hang around with me. And I'm going to hang around with you. I'm going I'm to I'm be in you. 
Oh, we're such drive-through Christianity. So busy. Always running. Always trying to fit God in our schedule. And Jesus says, listen, you keep on asking and you keep on seeking. Seek it in me. Abide, remain. It's this relationship. Not about him, but with him. And much more, he said, listen, you got to keep on knocking. In other words, the thriving relationship keeps on growing and keeps on going, and it goes deeper and wider and further in discovering what God has. Literally, Jesus is saying, the word here in Greek, aiteo, in asking, a present tense continuous, the idea is keep on asking. Yes, there's a point where George Mueller says, I prayed and we're done. That's great faith. But then that also implies a severing of my relationship in talking to God. They're both right, but the idea is this. Have such a faith as one time is good, it's enough, but continuing saying, I'm going to hold on to Jesus. I'm going to keep on asking the Lord Jesus. I'm asking for an answer, not my answer. I'm going to keep on asking. First Chronicles 16:11 gives a description and a command about this asking and seeking. It says, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. There it is. It's not a one and done. It's a, I'm going to stay with the Lord, and I'm going to ask the Lord continually. This brings to mind the Canaanite woman. You know who she was, right? that she had a demon-possessed daughter. She's leaving, she's living in her house with this demon day in and day out. Maybe some of you can exp- talk about having had that in your house. Not easy to live with demons, right? It affects you directly and all those around you. And it's happened for so long and no Pharisee or, or priest could help her. She needed Jesus. And she goes to Jesus. Remember the keep on asking? She goes to Jesus. And three times Jesus said, no, nope, not interested. She comes to him and she says, Lord, my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. Scripture is very specific. He could say he did not answer her. No, no, Scripture says, listen, he didn't answer her a word. It's as if Jesus turned his head the other way. Listen, it's counterproductive to say that. What do I mean Jesus is not paying attention to what she's doing? He's teaching her and the disciples and Israel a lesson. That is not what Jesus is, but that lesson is teaching them all the way to today. Three times. Then the disciples come and tell him, listen, do something because she keeps bothering us. She keeps on asking. And he says, no, no, listen, I've come for the children of Israel, uh, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not for the Gentiles. And that's the second time. Third time, she starts talking to him, and she says, he said, listen, I'm not going to give bread to dogs, bread for the children. And then she keeps on asking, and she says, Lord... Even lap dogs, that's the word. Even dogs eat the crumbs. The word in Greek is lap dogs. And I think of my little girl that jumps into my lap and she looks at me and how could I not, right? Even lap dogs eat the crumbs. She kept on asking. Don't give up. God loves to hear your voice. God loves to hear the heartbeat of your heart. It's all about the relationship. And then he says, oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Took a while for the instantly to come along because there was a lesson, timeless. There was an invitation. There was a description. I can do it. It's your faith. It took that many times to ask to get to that faith and trust. She believed that Jesus could do it, that he's the only one that could do it, and that he's actually able to listen to her, even though he may take a little time, and that time that he's taking is waiting for our hearts to be transformed. That time is not that he is deaf or unwilling. That time he is 
taking our hearts, waiting for our hearts to be crushed in humility. And then he says, now, now I see it. Keep on asking. And then he says, keep on seeking. And the promise is if you keep on seeking, you will find. Now, how do you keep on seeking and for how long will you keep on seeking? You've lost things at home, right? You've lost things in the garage, guys, right? Oh, my goodness, I've been working on a project in my garage recently, and I, spent, I think I spent more time during the project looking for the misplaced tools and items than I was working on the project. Where is it? I got to find it. Why well, said dinner's ready. Project's not done. I got to find it. How long will you look for it? Oh, I give up. If God's not going to do it, I'm done. I'm going to try something else. That's the flesh speaking. Jesus himself gives us the answer in Luke 15. What man of you, if he has a hundred sheep and he loses one of them, wouldn't you be willing to live the 99 out in the field? You know what that means? Out in the field where they can be stolen, out in the field where they could be eaten, preyed upon, out in the field where you can encounter more loss to your revenue, but you're going to leave them out in the field and you go after the lost one until you find it. Because you love it, you need it, you care for it, and you're going to look until you find it. People talk about going to prison and turning their lives around. The phrase is what? They, they what? They found God. Didn't know God was in prison, did you? <laughs> but they found Jesus in prison. How long did it get, take God to get them to that place where their brokenness said, I'm done. There's nothing I can do except you, Lord. They kept on seeking and seeking for satisfaction and purpose and success, and they found none until in their brokenness they found God. You seek until you find. Never give up. You ask Webb and Lorena how many nights they kept on praying for Jesse. You ask them when, when his own mother put him out, which she should have for his lifestyle and choices, how long they all kept on praying and how many times they maybe asked God, where are you? But they kept on praying and asking and seeking. And Jesse is getting a biblical degree or a business degree from a Bible college to do ministry later on. Keep on seeking. Keep on asking. Third command, keep on knocking. Yeah, I like to knock somebody's head in the wall, right? You get that last moment and place of patience. You want to, got to keep on knocking with somebody open. Not these days, but remember in those old days, I don't do Halloween. No regrets or apologies about it. But I remember back in the day, there were kids that kept on knocking. My lights were out. We were not going to participate. Listen, you don't participate in my Christmas lights and celebration of Jesus. I get to not celebrate about your Halloween. Period. But the keep, kids kept on knocking. They kept on knocking. They never got the point. They kept on. We want the candy. What does it mean to keep on knocking? Jesus, Jesus shows us. Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, just so we know, hermeneutically, biblically, this is not intended to be an evangelism verse, though we have used it, which is okay. Jesus is knocking at the door of the church the church of Laodicea that's lukewarm. The church of Ephesus that lost its first love. He keeps on knocking at the heart of the believer. It doesn't mean he doesn't keep on knocking at the heart of non-believer. Yes, he does. And he chases them looking for that lost sheep. But there he is knocking at the door. Why? If anyone 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The point of the knocking is that consummation of the relationship of fellowship as we have a dinner together, a meal. We sit down and talk. We've been so busy lately. Pastor Paul and I haven't had our weekly whoppers and I miss it. And he keeps on knocking. He keeps on texting. God bless him. That's right. I just remembered every week so far. Hey, it's that day again. Would you, would you meet me for a whopper? Oh, Paul, I would love to, but I can't. Next week. Because we sit and besides the whopper, not that's the best burger in the world, we share and we talk and we laugh and we pray. We're in such a rush with God and with each other. We have such little time. Jesus says, listen, I'm knocking because I want to come in so I can, I can eat with you and have fellowship with you. Keep on knocking. Not that you have doors of success being open. Not so that you would be renowned and seen and appreciated. Keep on knocking for that relationship, for that breakthrough in people's lives. Keep on knocking for God's will in your life that he will show you. Don't go left, go right. Keep on knocking. There's a progression in these terms that we can learn from. Asking is the first level or one level of inquiry. Lord, should I? Lord, which way? I'm going to keep on asking, Lord, to give me an answer. A yes is great. A no is just fine because I wouldn't want to be where you're not. So, Lord, I'm asking. That's the first level. But then from there, it intensifies. Just like prayer intensifies into fasting. And fasting intensifies in supplication. Supplication is a definition of keep on asking. So ask, that's the level, first level. Second level is seeking. That is, when you're just about to find what you're asking for, you go on seeking. You asked, don't sit back, don't wait. You ask, and now you start seeking. And trust the Lord to be leading. And trust the Lord to guide you through, as we talked in our Bible study throughout the week, through scripture and prayer and wise counsel and fasting and finally even a sign. You keep on asking, now you start seeking. In other words, asking plus action. We are believers of action. Third step, knocking, is another step up as we persist to find what we've been seeking. So I'm asking, now I'm seeking, I think I'm there, I'm knocking. Lord, if it's you, you're going to open, just tell me if it's not, I'll go to another door. It's asking, seeking, knocking. In other words, asking, action, and persevering. The knocking finalizes the persevering. You stand there until God opens. Don't give up. Paul was perseverant in asking deliverance from the thorn in his side. Was it a person in the church? Was it his eyes? How many of you have persistent and chronic ailments? Come on now. Yeah. In the beginning, you'll try anything to make it go away because it hurts so bad. For those who are tougher, you won't touch anything until it goes away because it's the weather or maybe you ate something. The point is when it hurts bad enough, you'll do anything. Now what can I do? Right? Paul is praying. Three times I pleaded. Three times I told the Lord... And if anybody's prayer is going to be heard, it's got to be Paul. Apostle Paul, that is. You too. But he said to me, he asked, and he's getting an answer. Jesus answers. And he's getting so much more than the thorn being taken out. My grace is sufficient for you. 
For my power is made complete and perfect in your weakness. And then his life is transformed and he says, listen, I got a much better bargain. I still got a thorn, but I got so much more. I will boast more gladly in my weakness. I'll keep my pain because what I got in return is so much more valuable. My pain is a worth price paying for the sake of Christ. And I'm content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I know strength. Don't give up. All right. So we made it the first point of the first point. We got ways to go. But trust, trust scripture. Jesus says, keep on asking. Because God delights in blessing his children and answering their prayers. Keep on seeking because the Holy Spirit has been given into your heart to do this one thing, to lead you. Keep on knocking because the Lord will open a door. In Revelation, he talks about, I've opened a door for the church that no man can close. You keep on knocking. Heavenly Father, every one of us here, have what we sometimes call unspoken requests. Well, I pray, Lord, that you would untie our tongues and our requests will be spoken. They will be cried out from our knees to the heavens and to your ear. Oh, you're a good father. You are the father of how much more. How much more will your heavenly father do for his children Oh, Lord Jesus, give us that strength in the spirit to never give up. But intensify and deepen our relationship with you as we keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for that message. I want to uh, encourage you to read the bulletin this week so you know what's going on. And mainly what's going on is there's lunch after church today, ladies' Bible study on Wednesday, Zoom Bible study on Wednesday evening.